obviously. I mean, one of the reasons is because I wanted to give the training. But the real reason is because I, was, I, I really wanted to find roughly around 100 people in Ukraine that will today be willing you know, to win together with Poland, right? <laughs> During the match. So, I hope you will all, in the evening, keep your thumbs for, for Poland. Um, yeah, this is my third time in, um, in, on XP days. Um, and um, in the meantime, I've learned some Russian, but I will be speaking, in, speaking English because there's, there are some people, um, yeah, not, not Russian speaking. Uh, although that would be an experience for me. I need to do it one day. Okay, um, why I think I can tell you something about XP practices, the main reason is because over four years ago, I've started a company, and I've started a company which, for which the, the foundation was supposed... Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the foundation was supposed to be XP. I've started the one of the reasons why I've started the company and didn't join something else was because I couldn't find in Warsaw any company uh, following this method. And maybe not what, what I was interested in wasn't precisely, precisely XP, it was more the programming practices. Pre-programming, test-driven development. These five years ago, I wasn't able to, f to really find even one company that was that could say that they were doing, really doing it every day, right? So that was one of the decisions. Uh, let, let's try to build it. Let's see if this way of developing software really sells, if it makes sense, okay? And after the four years, I think I've gathered, I've gathered enough experience to, to, sh to share it with you. The problem we currently have, I currently have as a company which is Agile by heart is that currently every company claims to be Agile. Try to find me one company that will be proud of saying, you know, we are following a waterfall process and if you start developing software with us, we will be able to deliver you the first package in half a year, right? Not many companies. So, so nearly every company says now, you know, we're agile, we're doing Scrum, right? So, these five years ago, I worked at Nokia and Siemens Networks. Now the company's name is changed. I worked at that time, it was Nokia Siemens Networks. And I worked there, among others, as an agile coach. And, um, and at Nokia Siemens Networks, some other coaches um, have developed something that's called a Nokia test. Nokia test for Agile, if you don't know it, is a set of questions that if you answer them right, uh, you can measure how Agile you are. So um, let's see what, what these questions are. So um, that will be a kind of a measure if your company is really Agile. So um, the first thing is iterations time boxed and less than four weeks. This is because at Nokia Siemens Networks, Scrum was the main ma method for developing software, so the f two to four weeks is the ideal iteration at Scrum, right? So time boxed, less than four weeks. Then newly created features, and a lot of companies can do this, right? This is probably one of the reasons why Scrum is so popular, because four weeks is, if I calculate it right, it seems nearly like three months, so they can deliver something, right? So, um, so, newly created features tested and working at the end of each iteration. And this is something that a lot of companies claim to have because they have a demo for customer at the end of each iteration. They are showing something and they think that, you know, that's enough to be agile. But what we have here is that it's tested and working. Tested and working means that basically you can deploy it. I mean, this is a package, right? This is something that's working from all the perspectives. Most probably the docu documentation for it is ready, it's tested as written, so this is something that can possibly can be deployed. And then iteration must start before its specification is complete. 
So you can, if you're starting an iteration and you claim to know everything, okay, this is not what we are aiming, aiming for. This is probably a set of micro, um, micro waterfalls. But this is not agile yet. According to the Nokia test, this is, if you do this, this is only iterative development. This is not agile yet. So if you want to be agile, or more precisely, if you want to say you are a company that's using Scrum, it gets a bit harder. So you need to precisely know who the product owner is. Um, you need to, so, you know, a lot of companies probably know it. But then, then they must have a product backlog prioritized by business value. And this is something I also work as, a, as an agile coach. I come, or team coach, I come to different teams to help them. And this is something that most teams don't have. They don't have one product backlog for a, uh, for a product. And it's very seldom really ordered by priorities, business priorities, or business value. And um, product backlog has estimates created by the team. And this is something that most managers will not allow for, right? Because the estimates, if created by the team, they influence the deadline. And the deadline most probably has already been communicated to the customer long before the project has been started, right? The team maintains burndown charts and knows their velocity. Now, I would, I'm not sure if I agree fully with this one. This probably, this, this may be true from the perspective of Scrum. I'm not sure if this is needed for every single Agile project, but at least a team must be, uh, must know what they're doing. They must be able to really clearly state we are able to deliver something within the iteration and what is this, what is this something going to be, how big it is. So whether, this, whether the velocity is a number or, or a gut feeling or, uh, or some non-measurable or not precisely measurable amount that's probably discussable, but at least the team must know the statistics on the rough level. And there are no project managers disrupting the, the work of a team. So the team is self-organizing and the team can make decisions and have power to make decisions, right? And if you ask all these companies that claim to be agile, if you give them this list, then probably it is not, they would have to, you know, recheck what's happening there and, uh, and if they still can claim this is agile. So, uh, but what is the reason most companies not, are not doing this? There are probably a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons is early 70s, or to be more precise, a year 1970. I know how many of you have heard this story. You know what this is, right? So this is a figure two of a paper by Winston Royce which he presented at a software development conference in the States uh, in 1970. And in 1970, I don't think there were as many software development conferences as we have now. So a paper on any of them would, was probably a big deal. And on this particular conference, there were people from um, Department of Defense of the United States. So people who were responsible for software for the army and software for the government. So, uh, and imagine a paper for a conference. It has something like six pages, something like 10 different pictures. You know, the, the first picture is probably something very general, and then the second picture with a description, implementation steps to develop a large computer program for, for delivery to a customer. That seems like a recipe for success, right? So, the guys from the Department of Defense um, they probably, you know, just, the first page wasn't full because there was a big photo and then, a, and then an abstract and then just few lines of real text. That was the second page. If probably that was enough. So, um, what they did, they probably stopped reading here. And uh, if you read Wikipedia on that paper, it says that he was, Winston Royce was the first who described the waterfall model for software development without using the waterfall term, nor he advocated the waterfall model as a working methodology. Royce, in fact, said that this thing here was risky and invites failure, right? 
and went on to describe incremental development. But then, this is a standard by Department of Defense, who apparently weren't listening, only read the paper, they coined the waterfall term and, uh, and, and standardized it. Okay? And uh, if they were a little less lazy as they were, they would probably get to the last page of the paper, which kind of summarizes usually some research, which looks like this, right? And, um, and this is something else. There are some arrows that go back. This, it, it, it says software development somewhere here. Um, so, you know, that's much closer to, to, to what we know now, right? But why is waterfall, why does waterfall seem so, um, so intuitive to us? Why is it so easy to accept it as a reasonable, or was it so easy to accept it as a reasonable approach? This is probably, I mean, intuition is one thing, and the intuition has been formalized by Barry Boehm with, with this uh, sentence. Cost of change grows exponentially with time. Um, which basically means the later you perform a change, the later you start changing the software, it's not a linear process, it's an exponential process. Because ideas are much cheaper to change than software. And bugs are much easier to fix if they are found very early than once they are in production, right? So this is the, the curve that he came with. And uh, obviously, waterfall model doesn't help in, in changing that curve. Um, so what, what came then with agile software development and agile approaches, which were even before the agile name, agile term uh, was coined, uh, that was probably true in 70s. That was most probably true still, you know, or close to true, true still in 80s and maybe in even 90s. But now the world is completely changed. Do you know how software was being built in seven, you know, this paper is from 70, so the research was being done in 60s. Do you know what, how software was built in 60s? It was built on paper. People, people were writing software on paper with their pens. If they were lucky, they had typewriters. Now, in States, everybody had typewriters, but okay, so not paper, typewriters. They had typewriters, and then what they coded, they were reviewing for many days. I have a friend who's currently over 70, and he was software, development, software developer in 60s. He's, he's American. And he said that before they had a chance to access any computer, they had a lot of days to sit and look at the, at the software, at every single line of code, because there were a lot of software developers and very few computers. So, you know, there was a huge queue of people who we're fighting for computing time, and uh, and 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 you had if once you've written something, you had to be sure it was very, very, very precisely what you wanted to have, because any mistake was taking weeks to recheck, which is a little bit different than unit tests now, which take a few nanoseconds, right, or milliseconds, to execute. They didn't have that option. Also, most probably from the process perspective, you know, they didn't have Skype, they didn't have email. If they wanted to have an update on requirements from the business, they probably needed sometimes even to fly to a different city, uh, you know, to talk with the customers if they really wanted to. So, so huge specifications and a lot of time spent designing and thinking on what you have before it gets to the computer was probably very reasonable that time. So it was pretty intuitive. Now, the situation is completely different. Not only can we, which was at the very first um, topic in, 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 this, in this room today, not only can we do test-driven development and, and, and iteratively, add, iteratively add features and, and test them at the same time, but we can even deploy software without any help of, of a person. We can deploy software uh, automatically, 
a lot of times a day, right? Which was absolutely impossible. I would say even 10, time, 10 years ago, that was very hard. 20 years ago, that probably was impossible. But, that, but is it really true? Does the cost of change really uh, must grow exponentially with time? So one of the claims that Kent Beck, the, the, the originator of, of XP made, was it does not have to. We can flatten the curve by minimizing the feedback cycle. That's why XP is, 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 is built on top of a, a lot of feedback cycles. You've got the, you know, the smallest possible feedback cycle, obviously, is in your head. The next one is when you work in pair with somebody, right? Um, then the next feedback cycle is your unit tests. Then the next feedback cycle from which you can learn is continuous integration. Then you have a feedback cycle of a daily stand-up, which is less technical, more business-related. Then you have a, um, a weekly demo to a customer or daily communication with a customer in XP even feedback cycle. And then you have release feedback cycle, right? So by, by minimizing the impact of your changes and verifying what you're doing, both from the technical perspective and from the business perspective, very often at the source without any intermediate people, you are able to, f to, to, to kind of flatten this curve. Obviously, it will, not, it will never be flat. I don't claim this is, this is not based on any real data. I just made it up. But certainly, it is, not like, it is not going like this. And I can tell you because we, in our company, the first project that we've started this four and a half or something years ago, it's still being developed, and it's still being regularly deployed. And now it's like 300,000 lines of code and it's still being maintainable, and it still has a lot of tests, and it still doesn't have... A, we still don't have a bug tracker for tracking hundreds of bugs. The software, because it was being built from the beginning on, on feedback cycles, on regular talks with the customer on the business side, and regular reviews of what is being done with the customer business side, and on very solid testing automation, on the technical side, we are still able to develop it, not only maintain it. I wouldn't call it maintain, maintenance. This is a development, normal development of the software. OK, so um, this is one of the points, the, the claim that the exponential growth can be changed. That was one of the points that was made just before the Agile Manifesto started. Then we had the Agile Manifesto, and then at the beginning there was, a, after the Agile Manifesto, one of the reasons it didn't, the meeting in Ohio didn't produce one uh, Agile method was because there were a lot of 17 people, and nearly each of them had his own idea on what a, an Agile process should be. So, uh, you know, there was feature-driven development, uh, APM, there was XP, Scrum, and a few others. Um, so then, in the beginning, I still remember, in the beginning, there was, a, there was quite a few books on extreme programming. If you, if, you, if you look for books on extreme programming, they will be mainly from end of 90s, beginning 2000. And now, the desert. I haven't seen a single book on extreme programming for years. So, um, why is it so? Because of the S word. The, uh, this is an XP conference, so I probably should not be showing this. But, but this is a huge success, right? This is a huge commercial success. People, it's like, uh, it's like Coke. When you think Coke, you really think Coca-Cola. If you think Agile, you think Scrum, right? Because of the conferences, because of the certification program, because of books, uh, because of coaching, because all of the marketing targeted at enterprises, at big companies. And from that perspective, this is a huge success. The fact that the PMI Institute is currently adopting 
agile software development as one of the core practices for the, for the last years. This is, in a way, a huge success, right? On the other hand, why is it so easy to accept Scrum? You know, the iterations can be pretty long. We're not talking here one week and that's it, as in XP. It can be one month, which is much easier for most companies. It's a well-defined process. Nobody really tells you here, you know, if you're doing the same thing, precisely the same things over more than a few iterations, you're not doing XP anymore, as, as Ron Jeffries said. This is, you know, you can do Scrum by the book, and you can even find coaches that will tell you if you're not doing Scrum by the book, you're not doing Scrum, so that's a sin, right? You should be doing Scrum. So, um, the problem with it is that that's a point when we do this. At this point, we, we are not agile anymore. We are Scrum and we are not agile. Well, normally it's the other way around, right? People say, we are agile, but we don't do Scrum. If you follow the process precisely, you do Scrum, you don't do agile anymore. Because in agile software development, a process is only a hypothesis. This is not a, a dogma. This is a hypothesis that you're testing all the time, like in, like in lean product development, right? Each increment is a hypothesis that is being verified by the users. Do they like it? Do they not like it? Same here. Each, each change to the process is a hypothesis. Is it improving the way we're working, or is it making the way we're working worse? So the process itself is test-driven, and it itself is emerging and evolutionary. So now let's talk a little bit about XP. So Ken Beck said that XP is a discipline of, so of software development. So he even didn't like to use the, the word method nor methodology, which is even something else. Um, he was saying it's a discipline. And discipline is in sports, right? In sports, you know, we will have a match today, and you will see that these people are not doing precisely the same thing every minute. There are some rules, there is some guidance, but the Ukrainian team will be probably following the rules a little better than our team, and we'll see what happens. I guess ours will be more evolutionary. I'm only not sure whether they will be able to you know, get the evolution to the right point within 90 minutes. Um, so that's a, there are things you can, you must do. There are things you must follow, and there are things which are fully optional. You can add, you can modify, right? I can give you an example. I have a son who's 11, and he trains water polo. And water polo is a very aggressive discipline of sport. You can do a lot of things. If you swim and you have a ball, they can basically do anything to you. You know, they can, they can put you underwater, basically anything. As long as you keep the ball, uh, you know, really, there's a lot of situations where there's a lot of blood in water. This guy doesn't have a ball, so this, this probably is not... I, I, when I was preparing to the, uh, yesterday to this talk, I found that it says Nina here, so he's Russian-speaking. And he's, he's, apparently he's white and red, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to... don't want to be beaten up. Okay, so there are certain things you must do. Uh, one thing in XP is you must write tests before the code. So that's the test-driven development part. You must program in pairs. If you don't program in pairs, that's not XP anymore, right? So th these, are the, these are the rules that you need to follow. You must integrate frequently. These are things you cannot loosen up. You must be rested. So if you're working 14 hours a day, including weekends, this is not XP, even if you're following all the most extreme practices. It was called, in the first version of XP, it was called 40-hour week. But then people from France who normally work 35 hours a week said, hey, come on, why? <laughs> we have our lives. And then the same with the Scandinavia, they work 37 hours. Um, 
you must communicate with the customer daily uh, and not every end of iteration, right? Uh, you must follow the customer's priorities. And uh, you must leave the software clean and simple by the end of the day, and this is most probably the, the hardest thing to do, because everything else you can kind of cheat. If it's going to be, if you want to have a situation that you're really able to, to have a package that works at the end of each day, it's clean and simple, I don't want to dive into this, but these two words have a very precise meaning in, in XP. Uh, like simple means it has tests, um, then, then this is very hard to do. So now the point is, you know, most of you, I don't know, how many of you are working in teams that do this? It's not that bad, actually. It's not that bad, because I thought that w there will be like two people, and there's like six. So it's not that bad. I mean, because this is very hard, and because the reality, you are not the owners of the companies. And even if you were the owners companies of, the, of the companies, like I have, like I am, there are still constraints. I have customers, and in the end, the customers pay me. So uh, even though, though I own the company, there are things we need to you know, loosen up, we need to make agreements upon, because we are not doing a product for ourselves, we're doing products for others. So because it's so hard to do, because it's very often impossible to implement in most of the cases, the point is, you know, try to do whatever you can. Obviously, it would be great to have all of this, but it's, if it's impossible, then let's try at least to start different things, and let's see, let, let's, let's try to make the process a little evolutionary. Let's start, try to mutate the process and see if it improves our performance, if it improves the way we work or not. Oh, sorry, there's one more. You must adapt the process and practices to your environment, right? That's the adaptation, that's the modification of the process that needs to be performed all the time. As I said, Ron, Ron Jeff, Jeffrey once said, if you're doing XP for more, I don't remember, was it three or six iterations, a small number, the same way, this is not XP anymore. So evolution of a process is kind of built in. Built in. So now, why is, why is extreme co programming called extreme programming? The main point is, if something is hard, let's do it more often. Testing is hard, so we're doing it all the time. Working in pair is hard because you need to focus all the, all the time, and, and you're kind of naked in front of your colleague. He's, he can see your code. So this is, you know, like when you see it the first time with somebody in a pair, I can remember when I was a teenager, the first time is always hard. And um, so we do it more often. And as we grow, we also do it more often. Then if something, it, oh no, <laughs> I didn't want to go there. Um, so like, you know, early testing is good, right? To test early is good, so we're doing it more often. Design is good, so we're doing design all the time, not only at the beginning of, of, of the process, of the, of, of the project. We're doing design during testing, where we de creating tests when we design the API of what we're going to implement, during coding, and then even more during refactoring, which means we're doing design at least two times every, I don't know, 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, sometimes every five minutes, right? So things which are good and things which are hard to do, we're trying to do as often as possible. The second one is maybe not that extreme, but usually when something is hard, most people just skip it. They try to give it to others or, uh, or just skip it, try not to do it. In XP, we're trying to do it as often as possible. And this is also where continuous deployment comes or continuous delivery. Because delivery is so hard, because it takes so much time, let's do it more, more often. Let's, let's, let's do it all the time. Okay, this is a, a graph from Ext Ken Beck's Extreme Programming book. This is a graph on 
the, uh, the, the practices in XP, I won't be going through all of them. Let's only go through the ones that are crucial and the ones that you can eat, start implementing in your teams. So, um, so do you know what this is? That's a spaceship, right? Uh, um, come on. Yeah, that's Ariane. Ariane was a European Union program uh, for 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 the um, for the rocket, and um, it, it, that was Flight 501. It was 10 years of work and costed five and uncountable number of zeros euros. The whole program to start it up. And uh, you know what this is? It's the same thing, just 10 seconds later. I don't know, maybe that was 30 seconds. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the reason was the software. That's probably the, the, ma the, the, the most well-known um, software-related, the, the most costly software-related um, event on the planet. And you can say, you know, we don't need that level of quality. We are not doing life-critical systems, most of you, I guess. We are not doing, um, I don't know, projects for five billion gazillion euros. We just do web projects, right? And this is true, right? So there are companies Oh, sh I shouldn't be showing. There's, uh, Vo there's Wojtek from Jira, and this is Jira, right? Did you know it? It's on the internet. Okay, um, so this happens, right? This happens to everybody. Uh, so now let's try to minimize the probability of, of this happening. Uh, so what, what can we do to minimize it? One of the ways that I have proven with my work and with the work of my company with my colleagues is test-driven development. Test-driven development is a technique which, obviously, it will, you know, this will most probably at some point happen to you anyway, that kind of situation. But let's minimize how often it happens. Let's minimize the probability. And, and TDD minimizes the, the probability. Test-driven development is based on the cycle, red, green refactor, right? We're writing the test first, and, uh, and then implementation, try to go there as soon as possible, and then we're refactoring. So as I said, we're doing design here when writing the test, defining the contract for what we're developing, and then during refactoring, we're try trying to put in in the right shape. First, make it work, then make it nice, and then if needed, make it fast, right? So how can we start? Oh, one more thing with TDD. This is uh, how in traditional accept acceptable quality looks like. The red line is what your customer expects from you. The customer wants something. Sometimes it's in, even in a contract, it says, you know, we will not accept more than zero critical, 10 mi major bugs and, and 150 minor bugs or I don't know, 15 minor bugs, whatever, right? And then uh, you start developing, start developing, start developing, start developing. At some point, you realize it <laughs> and you start fixing, right? You fix something, and you've broken something else. Then we, we probably somewhere here have a test phase. We delivered to the testers. The testers start, started working on it. We're fixing. We hit this point, and yes, we can deliver, right? And then there is a phase two of of the development where we start here and then it takes even more to get to a reasonable quality. So then most probably the customer to get something delivered decreases his expectations, but at some point what we get is everything needs to be rewritten, right? So instead with test-driven development approach in, in general, automated testing approach and continuous integration approach, we're trying to keep the, accept the, the, the real quality pretty constant, right? We will have moments where it's going down, we will have moments where it's going up, but we, s we try to keep it always at the level of being close to zero ba known bugs, right? And why do we start with tests? That's a good metaphor. We start with tests because software development is risky. 
there is a high risk of introducing a bug. And if you do something risky, like climbing, I'm not a climber, but in climbing it works like this. Before you start climbing up, you put a hook and you're trying to make sure that if you fall, it will keep you. And the same here. We're creating a hook, we're putting a rope through the hook to make sure, with a test, to make sure that if something fails at some point, if, some, if, if the environment changes for some reason, we will be safe from this situation, right? And then how start doing it? You know, there's a lot of frameworks, and they're so simple, it's, you just need a start. So uh, I think the main problem with, with test-driven development is, is mindset. And people who were on my training the last two days, they, they've probably seen that the main point is not that there's you know, a lot of technology that they need to learn or libraries that they need to learn. It's, it's the bending of mind that you need to do. You need to change the way you're, you think about the software from going from inside the method because I know what I'm going to do to formalize the requirements within a test, right? And the only way that I really know to do it is to start doing it is just to start, right? Uh, so that's why the trainings that, we, that, that I'm giving, they're like, I don't know, 70% workshops because there is not much theory. It's mainly, you know, people just need to start doing it. And during workshop, that's a time that they sacrifice for, for just trying to do changing the, their approach, right? Once you start doing it, what's important to make it stick is to do it with the whole team. So uh, it's very hard to do it if you're alone on your team. It will bring you some value, but it, it's very hard to make it stick. You will have deadline, you will have pressure, and you will not make it stick. So try to convince the whole team just to try it. Make sense to get somebody who has experience in it so that you don't get into easy traps. Um, try to spend time with your team on, on katas, another way of coding together non-project code, so that you can you know, master um, test driving in your head. And then it makes sense at the beginning to have a peer review of what you're doing. The second thing that you could start doing is refactoring. And uh, I've, when I come to Teams, the first very simple test to check if people are doing refactoring is to ask them for a few shortcuts. If they are able to give me a shortcut to what is in Eclipse, if they're working in Eclipse, move method refactoring, or how to get quickly to pull up, it means that they probably do it from time to time, or even often. If they don't know it, you know, they probably do it once a month or something. And doing refactoring without the support of IDE is doing, doing it in a safe way uh, and reasonably fast is very hard without the IDE. Um, that's a code which I wrote a long time ago, still when I was a student. So refactoring is important, right? This is a real code. That, I didn't write it before. That's a real code. Right, so uh, if you see something like this, there's even a library to, um, to document it. But this is, this is why it's important to, to do test driven, to do refactoring within each cycle. Because you, know, you, start, you write one if, you write another if, you write yet another if, and without refactoring, you know, it's some, maybe it will not be that bad, but it won't be maintainable anyway. Uh, so, yeah, refactoring. The main point is not to change the code semantics, to make sure you're only working on a design and nothing more. How to start doing it? Without automated tests, it's very hard. You can do easy refactorings, you can do automated refactorings if you really know how to do a series of, of transformations, but it's, but it's very hard without the tests to be sure that you're not really breaking something. Makes sense to learn, not a bit, learn a lot about object-oriented design because without it, it's very hard to refactor to something that's better. It's easy to refactor to something that's worse. Um, 
And baby steps with refactoring don't go into the direction of spending three hours on changing something. Make sure you've got tests running all the time and do baby steps. And learning what your IDE can do for you is absolutely crucial. How to make it stick? Again, learning about patterns. You know, th there's a lot of books on, on, on patterns, pattern-oriented architecture, that huge series of books. Makes sense to you know, improve the workshop that you have and tools. And, uh, and force yourself to think what to refactor in every cycle. So whenever you, you've implemented something, just force yourself. Maybe there's something you could improve. Maybe it's just the name of one variable, but always try to find something to improve. OK, the next thing that you can start implementing in your code is pair programming, obviously. And, uh, and pair programming, one of the best ways to start pair programming is so-called TDD ping pong. Do it with TDD. And this is what is apparently very well known to politicians. I'm not sure, I don't know why it, this is not so well known to software developers is TDD ping pong works like this. First, the first person is in charge and writes tests. Then the second person is in charge, writes implementation. And then again, the first person is in charge and refactors the, the code. And then the second person is in charge and writes the test. The first person in charge writes the uh, implementation and the second person refactors what the previous guy did, right? I don't know why it's not that popular um, in, in programming. Um, I won't be reading that quote. Um, this is a quote from one of the bloggers on one, why, how he started uh, doing uh, pair programming. Basically, he was a typical guy who is sitting and, uh, and coding in his box and spending lots of, lots of time in his earphones. And that was starting to, do, to, to, to pair program, when he started to do it, he realized that going into the zone, into the tunnel of thoughts, is not really improving the, what, what he's doing. It's actually creating a lot of technical debt instead of improving quality of what he's working. You'll, you'll get the slides so you, you can go and read the whole, um, the whole entry. Um, as I said, pair programming, it's like getting naked in, in front of another person. They can see your code, they, can co they are commanding your, they should, be, they should be looking at what you're doing and, and, be, um, and be critical about this. So it is initially hard, but once you get into the way of, um, I into the, into the, into the um, routine of doing this, you know, it, it stops being so scary. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that people should do when pairing. Um, I think the most important here, for, for girls, it's this one, from the perspective of, if you're coding with a girl, it's for her important that you get a shower to make it clear. Uh, from the technical perspective, what's important is to switch pairs, right? If you switch pairs, you have a way of, there is a way that you can learn from others, and not only from one person. Can you imagine a writer of a book, a, a, um, uh, a guy who, who, who writes novels, and to write something good without reading, I don't know, 30,000 pages of novels of other people? There are very few people who can do this. Certainly there are some such, such people, but there are very few. But there are a lot who became good writers because they had a good experience reading when they were young, and then they were working on the workshop. How to make it stick? Good. What's important? You can start with anything, right? Just get somebody to sit with you. But after a while, we'll see that good positions uh, to, with two keywords, two mice, is important. The second thing is initially people need to force themselves. It is hard. Initially, you need to make a team decision. We're trying it for two weeks, and then um, and then it will start sticking. Then collective code ownership. This is something that also not that many teams have. And this is the, the easiest way to achieve that. The, the easiest way to 
uh, to get read of the truck factor, how many people can be hit by a truck for the project to fail, uh, is pair programming. Pair programming serves two main purposes. One is the quality of what you're doing. The second is learning. It's learning your workshop as a developer, how to become a better developer. On the other hand, it's learning about the project so that you know, not precisely, but you know enough about the whole project and everything that happens in the project that you can, even if somebody is off, you can replace them. You usually start with one simple module uh, if, you if you already have a project. You start with something simple and have everybody work on this. What we have been doing in our company, we, when we didn't have a very high pressure, we, we, were, we, we, we were asking to join people on parts that we never worked on, if there are some such parts. So that, you know, kind of, from our will, we're going in a direction of, of, of wanting to do something else. Uh, can't refuse helping rule, so that, you know, people need to support each other. It, so it's, otherwise, it, it just won't work. Pair programming, as I said, and uh, automated tests. Again, it's hard to start con with confidence working on something you have no idea about if you don't have tests. I don't know how many of you have that experience. I had a few times the experience of being thrown into a new project by one of the, my managers. And how, how, are they th how, how are managers throwing you to the project? You know, start fixing bugs or work us on something alone very often. That's very bad. How to make it stick? Pair programming, pair reviewing everything. Can you have three minutes more? Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'll be fast. Uh, this is Jenkins, that's continuous integration, right? Continuous integration is very important because this is the way of how you can, uh, how you can really make sure what you're doing makes sense all the time. How you can be safe that you as a whole team go in the right direction. And, uh, you know, starting CI, CI is probably the, the thing that most teams, when they start be Agile, are starting with because it's the easiest. It's just enough to first install it, then automate your build, and then slowly add tests. Once you add tests, the next thing is maybe add static code analysis. And uh, then add another layer of tests. Maybe at some point add acceptance tests. Uh, you can make your life nicer, make it stick with, with a fancy radi radiator of information. Like um, one of the companies I've seen, they had the, um, I don't know how it's called in English, the, the, the police light that the po police car has on top. And if the build was wrong, it was, you know, making a lot of buzz. So, um, you know, these things can support you in, in making a, a, specific, um, a specific practice stick. As you can see in all of these practices, I was mentioning pair programming, because pair programming, from my, perspe from my perspective, from my experience, is th the thing that keeps all these things together. It gives you the knowledge of the whole picture of the project. It gives you the way to improve your skills. It improves the quality of the project. So uh, that's kind of something that's in the middle and puts all these practices together. So as you see, extreme programming is basically about all these factors, with the quality as being the most important. So I think going in the direction with little steps, even if your team is not fully agile, even if your team is not purely XP, starting with little things here and there to improve the process, to work evolutionary on a process, can only do, do good to your project. It, it will not make the project worse. Thank you very much. <laughs>